But I appreciate that. And I, God always takes care of us. Yes, He does. God always takes care he of us. He is good all the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to start a new series called Fixer Uppers. Ooh. Fixer Upper, maybe. And today I'm going to be talking about my part one is things that are things aren't always what they seem. Would you agree with that before I even yeah. talk about anything? Yes. Yes. Things aren't always what they seem. Yeah. You know, sometimes we look at things, we're such, you know, visual people, but I have a little story to say to start this with, and it's entitled, Things Aren't Always What They Seem. It says, two traveling angels stopped to spend the night in the home of a wealthy family. The family was rude, and they refused to let the angels stay in the mansion's guest room. Instead, the angels were given a small place in the cold basement. And as they made their bed on the hard floor, the older angel saw a hole in the wall, and he went over and repaired <laughs> it. When the younger angel asked why, the older angel just replied, things aren't always what they see. The next night, the pair came to the rest at the house of a very, very poor, very hospitable farmer and his wife. And after sharing what little food that they had with the couple, they let the couple sleep in their bed so that they could have a good night rest. And when the sun came up the next morning, the angels found the farmer and his wife in tears. Their only cow, whose milk had been their sole income, lay dead in the field. The younger angel was infuriated and asked the older angel, how could this happen? The first man had everything and you helped him. You patched up the hole in his wall. This, this couple, this second family had very little and they were willing to share everything with us. And you let their cow die. The older angel looked at him and said, things aren't always as they see. You see, little angel, when we stayed in the basement of the mansion, I noticed that there was gold stored in that hole. It was on the other side of the wall. And since the owner was so obsessed with greed and unwillingness to share his good fortune, I sealed it up so they couldn't find it. <laughs> and last night, as we slept in the farmer's bed, the death angel came for his wife. I gave him the cow instead. You see, things aren't always what they seem. And that could be for so many things in our lives. Because too many times, you and I, we judge the book by its cover. We judge with our natural eyes. We see things and we make judgment on them. And most of the time, church, things aren't always what they seem. You know, when we first looked at this building, I don't know how many of you were with us when we looked at this building. I could see the potential. Yeah. Well, listen, my husband could not. My <laughs> husband struggled. He, he just could not imagine this. He couldn't see past the dirt. He couldn't see past the, the, all the junk. He couldn't see. He didn't have the ability to see the potential in this old, run-down building. Sadly, some of us are the same way. We, don't, we can't see past the outer uh, layers of things. But listen, just as God enabled us to turn this old factory, cement, do you remember the cement, the dirt, yeah. the, yep. the smell, yeah. all that? Just as God enabled us to remodel this building into a glorious house of worship. Amen. Listen, God desires to build us into spiritual houses. Come on. God desires to do something. He desires, you know, like when we look at each other and we think, you know what, they just don't have it together. You know, they just, they don't, they don't look good. They don't sound good. They don't act good. And we already judge the book by its cover. 
But I am so thankful that I have God at the table to see my potential, Amen. not where I'm standing. Amen. God has the ability to see potential in you and in me. He is able to look past our faults. He is able to look past our ugliness to what he has put in us. To, to become, he desires to build us into a spiritual house. Not just a spiritual house, but a spiritual house. A place of glory and beauty and strength. First Peter second, or I'm sorry, First Peter two four and five says it this way: As you have come to Him, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Okay, we could stop there and go, yeah, okay. But here, let's move <laughs> on. It says, you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see your half-witted passion for him. He doesn't see your laxivity in, in the things of the kingdom. He doesn't see your failures and your faults and your sins. He doesn't just, he, he sees it, but that's not what he knows who you are. He has the ability to look past it and say, I know who you are. I have created you. I have called you to be a spiritual house, to be a spiritual priesthood, to be holy and blameless. To be a place of beauty and strength. Amen? Amen. So Father, I want to pray right now for each one of us as we, we sit in the place of, of hearing. God, that we would truly receive the wisdom of revelation. God, that you would teach us, God, how to see ourselves as you see your, ourselves. God, that you would help us and enable us, Lord God, to take the measurements, to take the steps appropriate to rebuild, to remodel, to even maybe at times to demolish and start all over. But God, that you would teach us to become the spiritual house that you called us to be. Give us ears to hear and eyes to Amen. see in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So how many, you know, like, like, we live here, I know that. Like when I go to when I go to Lancaster to see my son Aaron, like it seems like every time I drive out there there's like more things popping up, more houses, more developments, more stores, more like there's so much going on. And then back here, how many know that we live in a place where there's not a lot of new buildings going up? There's not a lot of new homes popping up, right? We live in an area where remodeling old homes are more common than building new ones, right? Yep, yep. It's just a fact. It, it, that's just who we are. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. You know, myself, Wolf and I, you know, 30, 30 some years ago, we bought an old fixer-upper. Like, <laughs> today, hold, your, hold yourself. We only paid $12,000 for a house. Good thing we're sitting out. Good thing we're sitting out. <laughs> But in that, so we, are, we understand, like when we bought our house, you know, we got it for 12000 and it was probably worth 12000 But here's the thing. <coughs> I could see potential. It was a very strong, sturdy house. It was a, um, what do you call it, a plaster, um, the wood, what's the plaster? Plank. Plank, plaster and plank, whatever. It, it was a sturdy, it was square house. It was a square house. It was very well structured. It was very sturdy, but it had some problems. Kind of like us. Foundation. We kind of have some problems, right? <laughs> but listen, this house, it was potential. There were four bedrooms, four big rooms downstairs, a full attic upstairs for my kids to fill it up when they move out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just great, you know. But it needed a lot of TLC. It needed a lot of tender, loving care. When we bought the house, the front porch was leaning forward. It was kind of like it sank. So the, my banisters were kind of like leaning forward. So things like that. My, the windows were pretty much like we had to put, come on, you all know, we're here in Cambria County. We had to put plastic on the window, right? Come on. All right. Like literally, it was just, it was a good house. 
And see, that's what I think I want to say to you and I. We, have a, we are a good house. Because God sees who we are. God doesn't look at you and go, man, you're falling. Like, yeah, oh, man, you're falling apart. Like, how many of you say, oh, I'm falling apart. God doesn't look at that. He sees the potential. He sees the stability. He sees the structure. He sees. He saw my house 30 years later. Yep. He saw my house 30 years later. If you come into my house, I, we got a new front porch. I got a new deck. I got siding. I got new windows. Not all at once, you, you know. <coughs> I got soft white pine floors. I mean, it, it's good. But it took time. Can everybody say time? Time. But let me tell you this. It's not a perfect house. Because about two weeks ago, <laughs> actually it was Sunday, Mother's Sunday, I was in bed and I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning, went to the bathroom, you know how we all do that, and I stepped into a pond in my bathroom. It was, my toilet tank was dripping all night. All night. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in your sermon? <laughs> <laughs> so I go downstairs to retrieve the bucket. Of course, I threw some towels because I'm talking, I stepped in water. And I threw down towels and I went downstairs to get the bucket. You know, I was going to mop it up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I hear drip, 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 drip. And I turned the light on into my dining room and it drip, 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 drip. Oh, no. My hardwood floors were all wet. Oh, no. The edges started to curl up. Oh, no. I was not happy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I was more in shock because I didn't, I didn't have any emotions. I even thought to myself, you're not even crying. You're not mad. I'm like, I just was in like shock mode. I was doing what I needed to do. All this to say that I had to call a restore a water res restoration company in, and and of course you know my ceiling was all yucky. And when they when it came down, when they pulled it down, I looked up in it, and I'm like, ew, ew. Because just because my house looked good on the outside, there were things that were covered up, some ugly things that were covered up. It was the old plaster ceiling that had some holes poked in it already. And I'm looking and going, you know what? The ugly's still under there. And I began to think of how sometimes it's you and I, that we put on this nice facade we dress up real pretty and we do everything and we, we put everything, the outward appearance, and it looks real good. But here's the problem. When we just cover it up, ugly's still in there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there's years. There's scars under the pretty. There's scars from our foundation. There's times from our past that we just cover up, we push it down, we don't deal with it, and we put up a new wall, and we put up a new ceiling, and we put up siding, and we do all that stuff. But that's not what God calls for our lives. The whole foundation, our foundation sometimes can get washed away because we just cover up. The problem is that eventually it will all catch up to us. The problem is that we live in a time, even today, where we are so obsessed with our appearance. Not just our physical appearance, but our house. How many, you know, the old saying that we try to keep up with the Joneses? Joneses. And to some detriment, some people do that with a detriment to their finances. And you could go on and on, but that's not my focus. But we live in a society where all appearance, that's all it's about. Because don't we have our iPhones that have those, those cool apps that fix us all up? <laughs> Come on, I'll be honest. Like, How many people do you think? Really look like that? Look like look that. You know, we put our photos through the Photoshop before we put them online. We like to hide anything that gives the illusion of brokenness. Right? We like to hide anything that gives the illusion of failure. We like to give the illusion 
of anything that looks perfect because we don't want anybody to see. Because nobody likes brokenness. Everybody likes perfection. But the problem is, there's no one. There's no one perfect, right? Amen. But here's the question. I begin to think about this. So we all do this. Every one of us, I don't care who you are, how old you are, how young you are, how pretty you are, how ugly you are, you, we all do this. We try to put our best face forward. And we try to hide the ugly in there. And we know we do that, and we know everybody else is doing it. But here's the question I want to ask you. Why is it that we get so bent out of shape when somebody's facade falls and we see who they are? Because you know you're doing it. I'm doing it. I'll be honest. I, I, I'll be transparent. Like, and I'm not giving excuses, but I'm in a place. So I have to put this up. Because <laughs> if you see how broken I am. But why is it that we get so irritated and so frustrated and we get so upset when somebody screws up, when their facade falls and we see who they really are? Or what they're really doing. Why do we, why? Aren't we all hiding ugly? Aren't we all putting up a nice ceiling to cover the ugly one? But Galatians 6, there's a scripture that tells us when somebody's facade falls and their ugly starts to appear, you know what the scripture tells us? The scripture in Galatians 1.6 says that we're, it, when, a, when a man is overtaken in a fault, when someone's overtaken in sin, when someone's facade falls and their ugly starts to show, it says, you who are spiritual are to restore such one in the spirit of meekness and humility. So looking at the facade and the cover-up and all that when we look into our, ser our sermon series, I want to talk about the fixer-upper. Because we all need fixed up, right? Amen. Yep. We all need fixed up. So I'm gonna, I kind of took the name off of, you know, everybody knows the Chip and Joanna Gaines. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, from HGTV, the fixer-uppers. You know, I love how they go in and they'll take a, a house that nobody <laughs> can even buy and they just remodel every undesirable place in it. And it, it, they turn it into an absolute, breathtaking home where everybody's clamoring to get it, right? And the best thing about how they remodel is they don't just put something over something else. The best thing about remodeling is they go in and they begin to demolish. They take everything out that can... You know, the scripture says everything that can be shaken will be shaken because there's going to be a time in our lives where God's going to allow things in our lives, just everything to be shaken. Because he wants everything that can be shaken to fall off and he wants to start new. He wants to start with the foundation. And he wants to rebuild us. He wants to renew us. He wants to remodel, reshape, <coughs> restore, restructure. And so we're going to be looking at that in this series. We're going to be looking at our emotional healing. We're going to be looking at relationships. Because how many know too? That you can look at the prettiest house, the, the perfect house. It's, you know, what is the perfect house? It's like the white picket fence, the dog, the, what is it, one and a half chill, child? Like, one, I mean, yeah, one point. Yeah, one point, some, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that works, but that's the perfect <laughs> house. Okay, but here's the problem, is what looks so good on the facade, if you go in the house, it's turmoil. Why? Because our relationships are turmoil. So I believe that God wants to begin to speak to us about our relationships. He wants to speak to us about what's inside us compared to what we're trying to project. So I have some, I want to take you on a little imagination tour. So if you could just imagine this, that you have a neighbor, okay, and, and they remodel their entire, their outside, their house. Outside. They've got new windows, they got a new porch. This isn't me, I'm not talking about me. Got a new porch, you know, you got siding. I mean, they, look, they planted flowers. They got a new, you know, 
pretty tree, bushes. I mean, it is absolutely beautiful. But have you ever noticed that you're never invited inside their house? <laughs> Why? Because if they let you in, you wouldn't like them anymore. Because if they let you in, you would, you would understand and you would see the embarrassment of how they are inside. I think of Jesus when he talked to the Pharisees. He said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but you're dead. You're full of dead men's bones. You're ugly on the inside. They never let you in because they're embarrassed because if you see their inside, you won't like them anymore. They don't have the energy to clean up. <laughs> Do you ever watch the, the, the show Hoarders? Oh my God. Yeah. If you're a hoarder, you can come up and I'll pray for you. <laughs> my husband used to say, oh, you just keep everything. I'm like, not really. But it's sometimes you, ever do, you throw something away and the next day you're looking for it. <laughs> and now you need it. <clears throat> but here's the thing. That when we live in such a contrast, if when we're living in a contrasting image, it's eventually going to catch up to us. Because I will guarantee, and I almost brought a picture of hoarders from the, from the internet to show you, but I will guarantee what happens on the inside will eventually spill out to the outside. See, the important question is, when God looks at us, what does he see? When God looks at us, what does he see? Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> see, he wants to see not the pretty outside, but he wants to see a pretty inside. And we need to work hard to keep up, keeping our house clean. You know, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says that the Lord does not look on the outward appearance as man does, but he looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. As I said, Matthew 23, when Jesus you know, spoke to the Pharisees and said, you look like whitewashed tombs. You, you have it all together. You, have, you wear the robe. You look good. You sound good. You say the right words. But you're dead. Here's another scenario. Imagine this. So you, now we're not going to talk about your neighbor. We're going to talk about you. So you Fix up the outside of your house. And hey, you know what? You start to begin to do something on the inside too. You start to deal with some of this stuff on the inside. You paint the walls. You lay carpet. You replace the old cupboards in your kitchen. You, you get new appliances. You hang up all the pretty you know, home interior and all that. You invite your friends over for a, uh, I don't want to say a welcome home party, but you know, like a renewal party. And you're just so excited, and everybody's like oohing and aah and gagging. Not gagging. <laughs> They'll gag later. <laughs> and about an hour into the party, you hear this horrific scream coming from your bathroom. And here, one of your neighbors are running out with such embarrassment to inform you that your plumbing in your bathroom is backing up <laughs> all over the place. And within, you know, you're so embarrassed and you're like, you just like shake your head. But within a few minutes after that, then you hear another scream from somebody in your kitchen. And your microwave is on fire. Because, you know why? Because of the wiring. And what happens is all your guests begin to throw their hands up and run out of the house. And in humiliation, you stand there wishing that you had taken the advice of some wise counsel who said you need to fix the inner problem before you put your, all your outside stuff up. Yep. Now, this is far-fetching, but it gives you the idea. And here's what I want to talk to you about through this series. What you and I do, we don't deal with the sewage and the garbage. We don't deal with the wiring. like So when we talk about wiring, it's going to be our thinking. Because a lot of us have, you know, the wire, the wire, the, 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 the thinking, thinking. something in there, the electrons, whatever. Neurons. They're just short-circuiting because our, our, our thinking is really stinking and we're not dealing with it. 
And the scripture tells us is how a man thinketh is so is he. And some of us have such raw sewage in our pipes of unforgiveness and bitterness and anger. And some of us are dealing with things in our lives, that, addictions, and things that whatever. I mean, it's everything. Some of us have, have broken relationships. And I believe that God wants to talk to us through this series to say, you know what? It's not about how pretty you look, how good you look, how, how you sound. It's not about your position in the world. It's about the foundation and the strong structure that you and I have as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so I believe that God wants us to start to work into that. Because Philippians 2.12, it says, Continue to work on your, out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So here's the problem that I see in many churches and many Christians. We come to Jesus and we get saved. Okay? The scripture tells us that we are a new creation, right? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. So we step into this Christian faith. We say yes to Jesus. And we're like, oh. You know, we think it's a glory cloud and like, whoa. You know, our spirit man is alive. Our spirit man goes from death to life. Absolutely. But the problem is, you and I still carry the same baggage, the same skin, the same pain, the same hurts, the same struggles, the same addictions. And what it is, is we end up having this concept that we're walking into this new house and God owns it and we sit back in our lazy chair and go, okay, God, you own this house, you fix it up. How many of you, you know, when, if you ever rented, there was a problem? Hello? Uh, yeah, the toilet's backed up. Can you come fix it? Sometimes we have that concept with God. We think that we come into Christ, we're a new creature, and we don't have to do anything. That's right. God is not going to come in there and unclog your sewer. He is not going to come in there and rewire your brain. You have to do that. And it takes effort. It takes work. It takes discipline. And if we could take the energy that we use to facade, to put up the facade, if we would take that energy and work on the inside, yeah, wow. man, we would be so much better off. Wow. We would be so much better off. See, Psalms, this is one of my favorite verses, Psalms 51, talks about David, you know, when he has, he's found out about his sin with the Bathsheba, and, and he, he cries out to God and he says, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew within me, right? Renew within me a, 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 a fresh spirit. But in Psalms 51, 6, it says here, truly you desire truth in the inner parts. I don't think anywhere in the scripture does it say, truly God, you want a size three woman with blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> Now, that might be on some of you men, your list, but that's not in the Word. But the Word says, surely you desire truth in the inward part. That's what God's after. He's not after your size three. He's not after your blonde hair. He's not after your blue eyes. He's after a pure heart. He's after truth. And it goes on and says, and you teach me wisdom in the inmost places. Paul the Apostle encourages us to, to remodel our lives starting from the inside out when he says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing, renewing of, of your, your mind. mind. Rewiring. Yeah. Are you getting the concept of what God wants to do with us? I mean, it's okay to be a size three. I don't know. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> But it's okay to, to present yourself in a, in a good manner. But if your outward is pretty and your inward is ugly, you've missed it. Right? You've missed it. We are responsible for the day-to-day -day functioning of this house. We are responsible. And for some of us, that means we are, we are called to restructure. Some of us are called to demolish everything that can be taken off without the house falling. 
That's taking the walls out. That's taking the wiring out. That's taking everything out but the foundation and the structured walls. And then God wants to rebuild you. But that is going to take time. That's going to take effort. That's going to take discipline. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about how a man builds his house. You know that story? The rock. That a foolish man builds his house where? On the sand. On sand. And a wise man builds his house on rock. rock. Well, what's different? It's the structure. It's how, it's easy to put up a twig house on the sand. But listen, right by the beach, the, the tsunami's going to come and blow it down, right? But to build a house on the rock takes a lot more effort because you've got to carve into that rock. You've got to set those things right. And Jesus says it's the wise man who builds his house properly. It's the wise man who builds his house, who works on the structure, but it's a foolish man who just works on the appearance of it. I have this question, I thought of it cute. Is the big bad wolf able to huff and puff at your house? Is he able to huff and puff and blow your house up? The question is, the big bad wolf, when the enemy comes and and all hell seems to break on you. Is he going to push you over? Is he going to destroy your house? Or your health, house? Is he able to take away? Is he able to crash your entire house? I'm gonna, I don't know why I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it. Infidelity in a marriage. That, you know, there's a, that's a huff and a puff to blow your house down. Are you going to be able to withstand and work through that? Or are you going to just let the enemy blow it down? Marriages can be restored through infidelity. It depends on what structure you're standing on if you can get through it. Or whatever else, a financial issue. Somebody loses their job and you, you're finally like, is your structure, is your structure there to keep you from being completely destroyed. Those are some things that we're going to start to look at in our series, Fixer Upper. Because I know when I look out, y'all look real nice. And you can look at me and go, boy, Pastor, you look nice too. But listen, we're all a mess. <laughs> we all got things that we can fix up. That's right. Some of us need to rewire our housing. Mm -hmm. Some of us need to, to get rid of the, the sewage in the, in the backed up pipes of unforgiveness. Some of whatever it is. But we need all of us to work on it. There's relationships God's showing me. There's relationships that need to be worked on in order for your home to continue to stand. So here's the bottom line for today. That we need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. We need to allow Holy Spirit to come in to be the inspector of the house. How many know when you're starting to do a remodeling job, there's always that inspector that comes in to make sure it's done right? Mm -hmm. And that's Holy Spirit. So we need to yield to the inspector of our homes and say, Holy Spirit, come. The scripture even says, seek me, search me, see if there's any wicked way in me. Are you willing to allow Holy Spirit to come in and really be honest and say, boy, you know, here's an issue in your house. Here's an issue in your life. Here's an issue in your thinking. Here's an issue in your attitude. Here's an issue in your heart. Because here's the bottom line. Until you surrender and submit to the inspector of the house, you will never have the permit to build new. So today, my, my takeaway this morning is, can we and will we surrender to Holy Spirit and allow him to come in and start to inspect and say, okay, you need to change this, you need to change that. You need to do something here. You need to strengthen the being because there's some heavy weight coming into your future. And if you're not strong enough in the word of God, when that weight comes into your life, you're going to fall. That's right. Some aspects we're going to be looking at self, with our soul, our mind, our will, our emotion, the battlefield of our mind. We're going to be talking <coughs> about habits of speech, unforgiveness. We're going to be talking about relationships, marriages. <laughs> Families, children, parents, we're going to talk about it all. Because we live in an area, as I said in the beginning, that we know how to remodel and we're called to remodel.
but too many times we're focused on the physical house and not the spiritual house. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to pray for you. Because I know in a, time, in a place, I, I'm first in line. I will stand up here and say, I need, I need Holy Spirit to come in and begin to teach me and help me and heal me. But the first, first step in all of this remodeling, fixer-upper, is to yield to the Holy Spirit. To say, <coughs> and listen, he's a, he's a gentle God. Holy Spirit loves you more than you even know. He's not coming in with a whip. He's not coming in with condemnation. But he's coming in with loving correction. He's coming, with, coming in with honesty to say, if you're, if you're willing, if you're, if you're able, I can get you into a place where everybody wants to come and, and mess. So Father, I pray right now for each and every one of us. Lord, I know that this word spoke to all of us because we all have places in our lives, in our homes, in our, in our hearts that need to be touched. We've, the scripture says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. And Lord, for many years, we've just been fixing up the outward. We've been doing things, saying things, presenting things on the outward because that's all that we are concerned about that people see. But Lord, you see the inward. You desire truth on the inward part. And so my prayer, Holy Spirit, is that you are allowed and you are permitted complete rule and reign and access into our lives as we walk through this series and that you desire to fix us, restore us, redeem us, and to fill us. And so, Father, I pray your blessing upon us that you, through this week, will start to speak to us and show us. And I pray, God, throughout this week, this weekend, that, again, we lift up the families of those who lost loved ones in, in the military. We pray your comfort and your mercy over them. We ask, Lord God, for protection over each and every one of us. Lord, whether we're out picnicking or with family and friends or wherever we are, May your spirit be with us. May your angels protect us. And may your son, Jesus Christ, always receive the glory out of our lives. And we pray this in Christ's holy and precious, magnificent name. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless you and have a great week.